Ancient legends tell of abandoned children reared in the wild by wolves, apes, or other beasts. In 1800, a naked boy was seen running wild in the forest of La Bassine, France. His background, unknown. Abandoned as an infant, he had somehow managed to survive. Could such a child be civilized? This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanation, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. Rome, the busy center of modern Italy, still clings with pride to its heritage as the Eternal City. Even its name has a romantic origin. Legend tells us that Romulus and Remus, the founders of ancient Rome, were suckled by a wolf mother. Notions such as this do not begin and end in ancient Rome, but continue throughout history. Many people believe it is possible for human children to be raised by other animals. We observe the movements and interaction of the great apes and see mirror images of our own behavior. They seem so human that they give rise to fancies such as Tarzan of the Apes and Mowgli the Jungle Boy. Yet, even though apes appear humanoid, they can be ferocious killers, more likely to devour a Tarzan than to befriend him. Many biologists believe these animals would certainly not raise a helpless infant. How much truth is there to stories of wild children, and how close is the Hollywood image to reality? What happens if a child is raised completely devoid of human contact? In this century alone, there are at least 20 photographed cases of children who have lived with animals in their social structure. This is Issa, the monkey boy of Ceylon. Found in 1973, he was reportedly abandoned by his family. This little boy was found scrambling up a tree with a family of apes in the desolate grasslands of Burundi, Africa. In Syria, this boy was captured running with gazelles. His captors, riding in a jeep, claim they clocked his speed at 50 miles per hour. Why he was exiled, no one knows. Why have these particular children either been abandoned by their families or expelled from society? Many authenticated cases of wild children involve youngsters with some physical deformity. There are societies which see physical deformities as being proof of being possessed by evil spirits. These deformed youngsters then often are killed or, as we have seen, cast out. A plastic surgeon from Glasgow, Scotland, rescued the so-called jungle boy of Peru. The newspapers sensationalized the story of the child and Dr. Ian Jackson. It's very difficult to find out what the true story was. We have been in Peru uh, subsequent to him coming here and we've tried very hard to find out how he eventually got to the children's hospital in Lima. As far as we can make out, he was suffering from some kind of illness which was slowly destroying the middle of his face. 
and I presume he lived in the jungle. Again, we really don't know about this. He was taken to a mission uh, hospital or a mission camp, and the uh, missionary said that they couldn't do anything for him. Dr. Jackson adopted the boy and brought him to Scotland, where with a program of surgery, he is gradually rebuilding the boy's face and helping the boy adapt to his new life. Shamdev, an Indian boy who growls, is believed to have been brought up by a pack of wolves. In India, there is a long tradition of wolf children. These photographs were taken in the 1920s by the Reverend Singh. He claimed that these two girls, Amala and Kamala, had been kept alive by wolves. However, the most famous wild child of all is the wild boy of Aveyron. In the year 1800, the people of La Bassine, France, caught glimpses of a naked boy living wild in the forest. He looked about 10 years old, but nobody knew anything about his past. Where had he come from? Had he been abandoned? How had he managed to survive? Sometimes, he would come close to the village to steal potatoes from the fields. He seemed as unaffected by the cold of winter as by the heat of summer. Captured, he was placed in the care of the National Institute for the Deaf and Dumb in Paris. For much of the time, the wild boys seemed totally apathetic, but occasionally there were strange outbursts of emotion. If the sun suddenly came out, he gave every impression of wanting to escape through the window. Parisians had expected him to be the epitome of their concept of the noble savage, much like our modern day Tarzan. The reality was disillusioning. The authorities quickly classified him as a congenital idiot and the public lost interest. There was one consultant at the Institute, Jean Itar, who believed that possibly the boy's apparent idiocy was only due to his lack of contact with other human beings. The methods which Dr. Itar was to develop over the next six years represented some of the world's earliest experiments in clinical psychology. To start with, Dr. Itar simply studied the boy's behavior and recorded his observations. The boy seemed unable to relate in any way to other human beings and tended to totally ignore their presence. All his moments of pleasure derived from an enjoyment of nature. Unlike people in society, vision was not his most important sense. He possessed an awareness of smells which would pass undetected by others. He appeared to make no distinction between pleasant smells and foul ones. Putting snuff up his nose produced no effect whatsoever. He was unable to recognize his own reflection. Nor could he differentiate between a picture and the real object. He appeared to be completely impervious to temperatures. He would put his hand in boiling water to grasp a potato without apparently feeling the scalding heat. He gave the impression of deafness. An unexpected loud noise produced no effect. But Itar found the slight sound of a walnut being cracked caused an instant reaction. So he concluded that the boy could hear perfectly, but his reactions were selective. Oh, 
Long months of patient care went by, and slowly, a change began to take place. The boy became cleaner and tidier, learning to dress himself. For the first time in his life, he learned to play, and although he could not speak, he now had a motive for wanting to make himself understood. At this late stage in his life, he was beginning the childhood which the severity of his existence in the wild had denied him. He was discovering his imagination. How much further could he progress? At the Institute for the Deaf and Dumb, Dr. Itar and his wild child pupil forged ahead. The doctor's work and the child's learning progressed more quickly now. They had the additional influence of the boy's governess, Madame Guerin. Through his actions, the boy gained the ability to express himself with increasing clarity, but speech eluded him. Dr. Itar noticed that one sound, O, oh, always attracted the boy's attention. So Dr. Itar gave him a name which included this sound. Victor? Voilà. Là, non. From now on, he was called Victor. Anxious for Victor to speak, the doctor decided to concentrate on O, the French word for water. Perhaps Victor could say O as easily as he recognized the sound. O, O, O. Undeterred, Itar continued his experiment with another sound, and eventually Victor spoke his first word, the French word for milk. Next, Itar set about teaching Victor to recognize symbols, first by matching objects to drawings, and then Shapes to shapes. The doctor's goal? To develop Victor's memory of a sequence of shapes, which in time would be replaced with letters. The letters then formed into words. To Victor, these exercises seemed pointless and boring. He could not appreciate the goals Dr. Itar had set, and now the learning had ceased to be fun. As the tasks became more complex, he became increasingly difficult and frustrated. Had Itar's revolutionary experiments reached their limit? Did Victor's learning abilities have boundaries the doctor could not trespass? Itar persisted, and slowly, Victor began to recognize words. The doctor would give him a piece of paper with the name of an article, and the boy would fetch it from the next room. Dr. Itar then took the experiment one stage further. He locked the door to the room.
What would Victor do when asked to find an item? Although similar objects were in the room with them, Victor ignored them. Itar suddenly realized that knife, box, and book meant only those particular items they habitually used in their experiments. So Itar had to explain that a book was any book. Gradually, Victor's vocabulary increased to include the use of adjectives. Grand livre, petit livre, grand livre. And finally, the ultimate achievement, writing. Victor never learned to speak more than a few words but he could write his needs. After six years of study with Dr. Itar, he moved out of the Institute to live a long and reasonably normal life in the care of his governess. Dr. Itar had kept his journals faithfully throughout his association with Victor. Their publication revolutionized educational treatment of the mentally handicapped. As for the wild boy of Aveyron, certainly he could no longer be classed as an idiot or a savage. We have always been fascinated by creatures that lurk within our imaginations. Fantastic creatures which are half man, half beast. Where our ancestors marveled at mermaids and centaurs, we wonder about Yeti and the Sasquatch. If they exist, are these really wild men? Have they perhaps been reared by animal parents? Is it credible that a ferocious beast would actually suckle a man cub and defend it against other animals? For one answer, we went to a remote part of the Scottish Highlands where one man has devoted his life to the study of wolves and their behavior, Ian Brody. To my mind, um, it's quite possible that uh, particularly a, a bitch who's lost the litter may well respond favorably to the cries of a human infant. And um, that's not necessarily conclusive that she would do so, but it does suggest it's possible. Um, it is man's oldest friend after all. It's also our oldest enemy. So we we brought it into the house. It's quite likely a reverse adoption could take place. The same way that a human baby cries, um, the mother then feeds it at her breast. Well, if the child cries and the wolf is prepared to allow it to suckle, then the, the cry is satisfied. No, no more cry, no more problem. So the wolf, you know, I think man and wolf, being two social animals, get on very well together. I think this is highly unlikely, and the reason I say this is that the human infant is the poorest of all survivors. Therefore, if a child is abandoned as an infant, there is no doubt that that child will probably die or be killed by predators, particularly in a, in a wild area of country. And I think what happens, if a child is going to survive, then he probably is older, he finds some way of surviving for, for himself. And because of that, he naturally becomes wild. He's got to steal. He's got to kill if necessary. Um, he's got to keep himself warm. 
he's got to hide away from other wild animals and so it's simply a striving for survival that will uh, condition his behavior but I really can't imagine that these children have been brought up by animals in search of has investigated isolated societies where survival is not taught but must be learned by trial and error These children may be a link to the totally isolated wild children who had only animals to use as examples. Perhaps the closest modern counterpart to wild children is a California girl, Jeannie, who was discovered in 1970. Her story is recreated here for In Search Of. She had been kept in a small room, tied to a potty chair, from the age of 20 months until she was nearly 14 years old. Her parents were charged with child abuse. Her father later committed suicide. Her mother was sentenced to prison. Since her release, Jeannie has begun learning basic skills, but progress is slow. Apparently, there is a time in our lives for learning such skills. If that period is missed, the full mastery of those skills may be lost forever.